All right, so I was just, I wanted to first say when we were precepted and I went through that experience. Oh, wait, 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 wait. People might not know you. Um, and actually some of y'all might not know me, let's be real. Let's do a quick highlight reel of our career. I worked um, in cardiac step down from 2010 to 2012. Then I did neuro ICU for about four years. And I did um, a couple of years back in that same unit. Um, that med surge uh, cardiac unit. So I was precepted three different times. Then I got my master's and now I run my own nursing education company. Brittany, go. <laughs> oh, wow. That was concise and beautiful. Did you, you left out like the 45 books you've written and <laughs> oh, all the wonderful, amazing courses and stuff But I'll, that, that she's written, guys. She's created <laughs> such wonderful content. Um, the Cliff Notes version. I became a nurse. In 2008, I worked in med surge for three years, like the good little nurse I was told to be. Uh, I realized that um, that was not the best fit for me and discovered the lovely career of informatics. Also started a, started a nursing blog along that around that time. I transitioned into informatics, never got my master's degree, figured out a way around that. Um, wrote a couple books along the way about technology and blogging, one of them with Katie. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, through that kind of built communities for nurses and healthcare. And that's actually what I currently do now for my day job. I build online communities for, for hospitals um, and also run the nurse.com, which is a resource for just basically anything you want to know about nursing. If you Google shoes about nurse for nurses, that my blog will show up. So it sure does. <laughs> it's a little bit of everything. And also you have really nice eyebrows because they look amazing right now. Thank you. It's uh, they are microbladed. I cannot take one credit, and it's I'm actually due for renewal. So the fact that they're still looking okay is um, they look yes. wonderful. Thank you, thank you. I've uh, in Nashville browsed by Bettina. I'm telling you, she's good, y'all. If you're nearby, that's, that's what's up. <laughs> All right, so I was precepted back in 2010 um, in into that one unit then into the critical care environment in 2012. And then when I decided to go back to this med surge environment, I had to get precepted again. It was a different hospital. And um, that was a new experience for me. I was also the old lady on the unit. Like these were all like 24, 25 year olds. Here I am, what was I, 30 maybe, or 32 or so? I can't remember what age I was, but it was like, I feel like I'm 10 years older than everybody and they're teaching me. So that was a very interesting experience. Um, and we are gonna just talk about some of the mistakes that we made as the preceptee during that time. Do you got one you wanna roll with? You got with one you wanna start? Uh. It seems like you've got the ball running. You've had a couple more precepting experiences than I have. Uh, so what don't you? I've messed and up mine's a lot. Kind of <laughs> My, mine's kind of pitiful. So why don't you go ahead? So when I was just came out of school and was getting precepted, I thought that my job as the preceptee was to kind of show all the things that I knew, right? And how quick I could catch on to things. So she'd be like, here's how we do this and that. And I thought I was already supposed to know how to do these things. And so I would put a lot of pressure on myself to do it perfectly like the first time. And if I didn't, like, I thought that there was something really wrong with me and my education and everything. So like when, so I just, I had all this, like unnecessary pressure. I thought it was a, I mistake, made a mistake thinking it's a performance rather than a learning process. Yeah. And Cause that's how every other job is. Your first 90 days are like, whether you get to stay, <laughs> like, so you think, you think it's some sort of big test. Why wouldn't it be? You're, you're right. involved in life or death decisions every day. Right. Like I have to prove that I've earned my spot here now, but Juxtapose that I have met other people though and observed where they kind of view it differently and that I've earned my spot simply because I got the job. So I'm going to be a little snotty and <laughs> overconfident, right? Like there's, you can, you could be both. Um, but I certainly was the like timid, meek. I'm not, I don't deserve to be here. I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> Precept D. I think the snotty thing is sort of interesting um, that you bring that part up because doesn't nursing school kind of teach you to be that? Like there's, I don't know what, how it, how it, 
perpetuates this culture, but I, I have not met a single nursing student or nurse right after they graduate that hasn't been told basically that they beat out so many thousands of people to get into nursing school. They survived yeah. nursing school because the first day they were there, they said, look to the left and look to the right. At least one of those people won't be there. <laughs> so by the that. end, they do. I, I, that exact phrase. Like, And I remember the, the girl who was there, in my instance, was a girl I went to high school with. And so it was very tr- impactful to me. I'm like, well, the, the old Megan didn't make it through. I did. <laughs> Megan <know>? didn't make it. <laughs> So by the end, you you feel like you've done this impossible feat and you've got this chip on your shoulders. So even if you're scared and timid, you do have this weird complex where you feel like you've done something that very few people can do. Mm-hmm. So it can create a lot, a lot of opportunity for overconfidence and conflict as that new preceptor because you've been hyped up to be oh, told yeah. you're awesome, right? And even I've, if you I've have that had- imposter syndrome. You know, I've had people actually through my blog reach out and say, so I came in hot as a preceptee, overly confident. How do I correct that? Because especially in I I say this, it does come off not so great no matter where it is, but especially in ICU, if you come in overly confident, like people that does not go over well but you're you know your first impression makes such a big impression and she's there's I I think I've had like five or ten people say like I don't know how to undo this like how do I fix this so it's like it's it's like you want to straddle that line between okay I I feel confident in myself to learn and figure this out and yeah I did get this job this was not easy but also have like some humble like humble confidence, like, but this is going to be really hard, <laughs> you yeah. know? I, I would say I was probably more in that category, but I had a weird, a lot of weird stuff happen my first year. So my emotions were all over the place. Yeah. I was definitely in the overconfident, not in the, um, uh, not in the way that like, I did think I knew everything, but like, I thought I needed to present like I did sort of how you mm-hmm. mentioned, um, to, in order to be taken seriously and have credibility, uh, and for me, that came not so much from nursing school, but probably from like growing up very poor and overweight and always feeling like I needed to, you know, come into a room and assert dominance and make attention be on anything but my weight or something like that. Like that, that That's sort of the mindset I walked in there with. And um, I can tell you from day one, I didn't win. I didn't win any friends because I didn't realize that my attempt to protect myself and to not look stupid made everyone think that I was thought they were stupid and that Mm -hmm. I didn't need them, which was um, devastating to learn and reflect and look back because that's not what I thought I was doing. I thought I was trying to, you know, run with the big girls. I thought I was, you know, getting, getting in there and proving I wasn't an idiot and that, you know, I I belonged was the goal, Mm -hmm. but that's not how it comes off. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's really hard, really, really hard to undo that, like immensely hard. Yeah, because while you're trying to undo that, you're also trying, you're building your skills and you're actually like learning and getting better at it, right? And then it's like, you know, your skills eventually catch up to your confidence level, but like, how do you, how do you save face, right? Like, you, like how to, I don't know. I don't, you know, like that's, uh, that's really difficult to do. And I think for a lot of people, like having to, like, I've also not, I will readily admit I'm wrong, probably almost too quickly, but um, I know people that even though they know they're wrong, or I've, I've met people and had interactions where it's like, it's okay, you can admit that you were wrong. Like, I need you to admit this so that we can work through it. But it's like their whole, they, it's like they can't say, I don't know or I messed up, like, like, they, they just like, it's like a, like a block, but they can't do that. And it's like, ah, this is so important to be a nurse to be able to admit you're wrong. And Isn't like, there like a lecture in nursing school about admitting responsibility as legal liability. And so we're trained not to like, there's this, there's a concept of not being allowed to admit that we're sorry and that we made a mistake because we're afraid that we'll be sued. So I feel like we're perpetuating this. You're, that's such a good point. I so when I was in in Charlotte and I was in I worked at a pretty big hospital and I was on this shared governance and all that and they had this 
they had someone who was in charge of grievances, okay, which for, and you needed someone to do that for a very large hospital, but she came in and talked about, and she couldn't figure out why nurses wouldn't say sorry. And I was like, let me tell you why nurses won't say sorry. That's like you get in a car accident. You don't know whose fault it is, but you don't say you're sorry because then it admits guilt. Like you don't want to, you don't want to get sued. You don't want to admit guilt. And then what ends up happening is these really mundane, meaningless things to you that you really could admit you're wrong about go, go like you won't, don't admit them. And patients can't like, Hey, it's okay that like you forgot blank, like, but don't lie to me about or pretend or completely not acknowledge this. Like, or you'll rationalize and say, well, I didn't do the thing for you, but this other person over here was dying. (laughs) You'll say that that to patients. I've seen people say, I've done it when I was a baby nurse. I've seen other nurses do it. And the patient doesn't give a flip, but you can't admit that, you know, maybe you made a mistake there. So you'll just rationalize every way around it so that you either don't get in trouble or you don't feel stupid. Because every... The first year of nurse is just, I feel like one 12, you know, 365 days of feeling stupid every day and trying oh. your best not to feel utterly defeated. And it, honestly, a good preceptor can help with that and a good mentor. And I think that's a lot of the, a lot of why we have that full year of, of utter discomfort. You need to be aware of correcting people constantly and that how that feels 12 hours a day weeks in a row you're constantly told you're wrong constantly corrected and nurses were a little bit of um control freaks and some things that we correct don't really need to be corrected like yeah i does the pillow need to be moved like seven centimeters that way because you prefer it to be moved that way like great but do you really need to correct me on you know like so it's like that was one of my pieces of advice for preceptors is like be aware of how much you're correcting this person who's brand new because you really can only take so much of that and it and it's one thing if what you're being corrected on results in hey this is actually the policy driven way to do this or this is going to make a difference if you do this this way versus i'm correcting you to my preferences so i need you to do everything the way i like it done because I, because i like it that way not because that's actually the only way to do it you know what i mean yes you know that's actually really funny one of the biggest mistakes that i made as a new nurse um while i was precepting and shortly thereafter was i would ask everyone in the unit how they did things i would ask you know susie johnny jimmy sally five people um how they did things. Cause I was curious, cause I was trying to analyze all the practices, what I had learned, what I could find on Google so that I could form the opinion of what I wanted. But that didn't go over well, did it? (laughs) The second I asked the second person one time, somebody said, why did you just ask me? Why did you ask her? I was like, Oh, well, I was just trying to figure out if she did it differently so that I could figure out how I wanted to do it. And she goes, you can't do that. Because when you ask somebody else, it's like, you don't trust what I'm saying to you and that you think my way is not good. And I I had no idea. Like, it never Mm -hmm. dawned on me that somebody would feel, um, get their feelings hurt. and take it personally. Right. Like, it's not like they were threatened, but they were irritated that they had wasted the time to give me their information. But I didn't find it was good enough, so I had to go get more. My personality is one collecting as much information as I can and then making my own informed decision. I I don't take anything for face value. Not that I didn't trust those people. That's just how I operate. I'll I'll Google for an hour to, you know, answer something that I should have been able to answer in 30 minutes, you know, in 30 seconds before. Um, And that was a really powerful lesson for me to learn that I can't can't poll the audience and expect people not to get upset because every nurse thinks their way is the best way. And if you've asked somebody else and, and you ultimately don't do it, they're, they're going to help you anymore. They get really offended by that. Yeah. You know, and nursing is such a team sport. It's not like you go and you do your own thing by yourself. You talk to all these different people and you have to work together. You need, you know, if you're drowning, you're going to need somebody else. So you have to build good rapport. So it's like, if you're someone who maybe never worked, um, never did like team sports or like a, like a performance where you all have to work together, like understanding the dynamics of that is, it can be really challenging. And you can find that things like that happen where it's like, I didn't mean that. Like, this is how I just, this is, 
like me learning the best way to do this, but then people can take things very personally and getting all of these like different personalities to function together at high peak efficiency because we're for some reason nurses nursing units have to always work at peak efficiency like you're not allowed to have an easy day if it's easy then you need to go home so we can make it harder for everybody else and save you know three hundred (laughs) dollars but like there's such a team aspect of it that I also didn't realize as I'm being precepted like I'm like I thought I just learned my own thing in my so- silo of my patients and I just do my stuff with my patients and I'll help someone randomly, you know, the code or whatever, but it's so much more intertwined than that. Like so much more, um, you rely so much more on one another than I thought you, you did. And you don't learn that in nursing school because you're so overwhelmed with your one little situation. Yeah. You're Survival. not paying attention to team dynamics. <laughs> It's interesting you say that on more than one occasion, I've asked you, you you have such an excellent um, communication style and teaching style for nurses. Like you you love them as you teach them. Whereas my style is very direct and matter of a fact, Mm -hmm. here's the information, good luck. And you, you're like a mama bird and you you put your hands around and you chew it up and you put it in their mouth and you you block the wings on the edge and you like, you have such a loving uh, leadership approach and, and education style. And it, I, I've asked you before, where does that come from? Like, I, I don't remember getting that. Like, it, mine was very much the whole, here's the information. You, you, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and get it done. And you said team sports. And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> totally did not participate in those. I did the <laughs> theater a bit when I was younger. But in then I would say, um, I would say that's probably not the best example because in theater, there's always like the three lead characters and everybody else has to get out of their way. So unless you're one of those, you don't really get in the team dynamic. So that's, that's the experience I had and not having played softball where we really had to coordinate like that um, Mm -hmm. is interesting because that's definitely the aspect that I missed kind of growing up. I had worked in, you know, circuit city and stuff and got knew how to work with others, but it's not the same as a unit where people die and you can't like somebody, you can't clean up poop with your 500 pound patient. If somebody won't help you, like there's a lot more reliance on your peers. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe I remember any education or even like a Frank talking to about, Hey, um, you got to make sure you get along with these people really well. Cause you know, it, somebody could die if you don't mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and not anybody's intention, but like people, when they're petty and bitter and get irritated with people and you create that for yourself, don't, don't always make the best decisions for patient care because their emotions get in the way of it. Oh yeah. And I've heard countless examples of that. And thankfully I've never personally experienced that, but I do, like, I remember when I started in the neuro ICU, they had such good team dynamics like you could, they knew each other so well that all they, they could detect a change in your tone. Hey, come in here versus, Hey, come in here. Like they could tell, Oh, I need to go grab, you know, some suction on the way. Like those kind like they just knew each other very well. And it is kind of like, even if you were someone who did um, swimming or something, that's an individual sport where you just, you worry about you I think, it, I mean, while there's discipline that's absolutely involved with it, but like having to, like, not just one of us doesn't win, like we all have to work together to reach this common goal. And I realize now that when I stepped into nursing, like day one, I viewed each shift like a game. We're all in this together. Like, I, who cares if I got done? Like, she's like three hours behind. What can I do to help you? Because these people need to survive this shift. Like just cause I had something easy. And then I would also expect people to help me, but it doesn't, you know, it depends on who you're working with, you know? And it's like, if you have like that group of people who all view this as a team effort and team, you know, this is us working together to get to the end of the shift, boy, those shifts go easier. You can even have the hardest shift but and the hardest patience. But if you have that group of people that understand that dynamic, God, it makes it so much easier and more fun too. I wonder if hospital, I mean, I, I don't ever remember seeing hospitals focus on this aspect. They they talk about like engagement of the individual, yeah. but 
and, and you know, when you if you work in a corporate environment, you get to do all these fluffy retreats where you share your, your, your heartbreaking stories of your childhood and you get to be vulnerable with your peers. But there's just no time to do that sort of thing on the floor. And, oh, I know. and prob- probably not an immense understanding of how valuable it is to, to build a sense of vulnerability and trust and camaraderie and teamwork among your peers. So it'd be, in, it'd be interesting to see. I haven't done any research on this. It'd be interesting to see what exists. Well, it's interesting because it's- like you, you hear the buzzword of teamwork, but what does that really mean? Like that's like to so many people, yeah, we got to work together, whatever. Like that's just us yeah. through our ship. Yeah. But um, unless you've had to really like, and it also, you know, when I did athletics, we do a team building exercise at the beginning of the year and it's like, all right, whatever. Like, but then when you get into your practices and get into things and you really have to rely on each other. But the thing about athletics is you get to practice, you have preseason, you have whatever, but with nursing, it is hitting the ground running. There's no practice other than I guess you no the orientation practice, but you better have a good head coach who's your preceptor or you're not going to not going to get that kind of support that you need. But it's interesting. I think there's also a, um, a big a misunderstanding around what the relationship between a preceptor and a preceptee is. Oh, Part yeah. of that comes back to the fact that if at best, most people get maybe like a few hours of training um, or a worksheet or something that says here are your responsibilities as a preceptor. I believe when I was precepting somebody, the doc, I got like a notebook that the preceptee brought and said, I'm supposed to fill this out with you. And I said, oh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was pretty much the same when I was a preceptor as well, like a preceptee, a, a new grad on orientation. I had this little notebook and yep. no expectation of what my relationship would be with my preceptor, except that she was there to help me if there was a problem and that we would start off, I would observe her for a little bit and then she would be around. But my preceptor happened to be um, charge, floating charge, but charge. And it felt like every interaction I had with her um was almost a burden because she was doing the stuff that she normally did. And then this was there. Like they thought because she was floating charge that having the preceptor would make the most sense. I actually got shifted to a different preceptor midway through. Um, And I I remember not thinking anything like that. I had any friction with my preceptor, but I always just felt like, Oh gosh, I'm such an inconvenience to her. And I, uh, I wonder like, did she ask for me to be moved? Like I never knew, like, was I a problem? Was she just busy? Did somebody else, the say that they could do a better job <laughs> and what, what happened yeah. there. And so you have all this doubt preceptor ended up having had a similar personality to me. The other one, um, the original one had a more softer tone, sweet Southern, you know, bless your heart sort of, sort of gal who was lovely. Yeah. But the preceptor ended up having was someone who was very matter of fact and direct as me. Um, <laughs> one time I walked into a patient's room uh, who had, um, uh, died at some point. I was very new. Um, I think I had been there for maybe three weeks at that time. And she was a, a DNR and all that kind of stuff. But like, I had never, I had never seen a dead person before that I can recall from other, maybe when I was little. And I remember I walked out of the room and I said, um, the patient has expired. <laughs> and he <laughs> says, well, how do you know? And I said, oh, it's pretty obvious she got it. Why didn't she, oh. she, and she was messing with me and I didn't know this at the time I was in shock you know this 85 year old sweet little old lady was dead in that room and she said why don't you go take her vital signs and I did <laughs> I said everything is zero and I think she had just about lost it she died like they knew she was p- gonna pass you know yeah. it's it one of those things I, and looking back I'm really sad like she died alone like that to me was a oh, yeah. part of it but as a pre as a preceptor and, and in that preceptor and preceptor relationship after I sort of figured out like she was gonna have fun with me at least in the terrible moments like that was such a relief compared mm-hmm. to what I had before which was where they would just kind of pretend everything was fine you know, when yeah, I probably was doing stupid stuff. Well, what's interesting is people are so different because like, I would be like, oh, that was, that was you know, like, ah, I get it. But then like, I, other people would be like, interpret that as hazing, you know? 
So I was bullied fairly early. Like I want to say within the first eight weeks, six weeks, and she was there at the tail end. I think my orientation was 12 weeks altogether, something like that while I was being precepted. Um, and she, she had observed that and was very kind of kind to me. And oh, like, and, and so I knew that she was like, not on my, you know, not on the bad side. I think she bought my son a birthday present. Like that's the kind of person that she was. She was just very, she was very, um, anyone else would probably think she was intimidating and mean, but like she was kind to me. And I knew that all that her, that intimidation was her sarcastic gen X humor. And that's yeah. what my dad was. <laughs> yeah. 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 To that. Um, so I can see why someone else would see it, but I think we had built enough rapport that, like in the end, I was like, well, I feel kind of stupid, but like also good job. <laughs> and I didn't know, like, I didn't know you didn't have to go like, and I don't even, I really don't even know at this point. Or you, I assumed you were supposed to go check a blood pressure. To make sure oh, you really did. Well, yeah, like you listen for whatever it is, like a minute for apical. <laughs> and what's, what's funny is like, I'm not the person to pronounce them or whatever, but like she just thought that was the funniest thing ever. It, but that was one of those moments when I was being precepted that like, I guess the whole um, anxiety of it was, was made to be, had, had a little bit more levity. And I just thought that was really nice that, you know, we could still it, it enjoy um, a comic relief moment in, yeah. the, in the tragedy that is, that you experience every day as a nurse. Like nothing's funny about that, that a person dying, but the fact right. that I thought I needed to, take a blood pressure on them. It's pretty it's, funny. It's pretty comical. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's, I, that, like we've said, that's uh, kind of a coping mechanism that we use because we're a regular, we have, that's vicarious trauma. We see trauma all the time. One of the ways we cope with it in the moment is humor. Um, but it is interesting how preceptors and preceptees can have different personalities and, um, and the expectation of the role, like, Oh, like you said, like they just, I had a booklet. I had no idea. And then when I became a preceptor, it was here, go to this eight hour class. Here's like, we're going to talk about adult learning theory. Adults learn better by doing blah, blah, blah. It's like, I don't care about that. Like how many patients do I give them the first day? Do I give them patients the first day? Now, now, like, what if I show them how to like do IV tubing and they can't do it after 10 tries? Do I, do I say, call it, they can't be a nurse? Like, how do I do this? And it's just such general information that you are flying blind almost. Yeah, um, it's really weird. Um, it, it's almost like being a preceptor is like this choose your own adventure thing where you get to determine the destiny of this nurse, like and, and a, a certain amount of her success on the unit. And nobody tells you how to do that. Yeah, and yeah. Um, there's no like test. Like I always thought it was funny how there's no test to get into nursing school. Like, to me, there should be some sort of integrity or compassion or like, cause you could get Dexter that just is really good at memorizing bones and gets through nursing school, you know, it's just, and, it, and they, those people exist. And unfortunately yes. there's some really statistic, statistic people who become nurses and, you know, make terrible, do terrible things. But the same thing happens when somebody's made a preceptor. It's it's often the person who who um, is somehow the charge nurse or something and not validating whether or not they're actually a really good mentor or a teacher. Mm -hmm. And then they may do it terribly. They may hate they may be hate that they've been asked to do it. It may be something they don't want to do at all. And then they or, project all that onto their preceptee. Or they really have a lot going on inside them. And now they have a, a person below them in the hierarchies that they can express their, like, let that out on. Like a safe place to be a jerk. And it feels good to them because they can yeah. have an outlet for their negativity. And then this person, like, gets, like, has to absorb all of that. And then they're, but then you, and it's like that power gradient, right? You're brand new. You don't know what's normal or not, especially if you're a new nurse. What's okay? What should I expect? Because you're in your own head game of I need to save face and look like I know what I'm doing. So it's like I get messages all the time from my preceptor is a bully or my preceptor is so mean or I did a podcast, Nurses in the Know podcast, and one of the hosts was saying how 
yesterday in the ICU. I see this nurse crying in the corner and I asked her what's going on. She said her preceptor is bullying her and won't tell her the right thing to do for this like intubated patient who needed something. I don't know. And I'm like, and then so she said, I worked through it with her and we figured it out, but it was just like, why is this okay? I'm like, why is this okay? Like, You know, it's funny because I have this weird, I have this need to try to figure out why people make the decisions they make and they do the things that they do. And I've thought about this because of my um, very terrible experience as a, as a nurse when I was bullied. Precepting was decently okay. It was about half and half. But as soon as I got done, I was bullied pretty maliciously for the first full year. Um, and then uh, during shift change <laughs> for a couple of years after. Um, and I've found that there's it's there's two problems that exist. One, new nurses don't know what's acceptable, and no one's there to advocate for them um, in the way that they need to. Hospitals largely just don't have the time to get in there and say, "Hey, this is what you should expect." I mean, right. sometimes they it's not in their best interest because they don't want to have to deal with yet another person complaining about not being treated well. Like right. it's sort of it's sort of a nice thing to keep out of sight, out of mind. Um, and no one probably wants to admit that, but like, mm-hmm. you know, if they can just let them figure it out with, don't, as long as they're unsafe, not un- being unsafe, like I can't yeah. deal with the drama. Right. And then preceptors are not really given the um, emotional toolbox and leadership skills to know what's acceptable and unacceptable. Um, and some of them may have had absolutely no training. They might not even like there's I can think of so many HR and legal things that can possibly come up in those relationships that they have never had any context about whatsoever. Um, And and they're just kind of giving, you know, free will to potentially abuse somebody and then not realize they're being abusive. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that most preceptors go into it thinking, um, even if they're voluntold, thinking that, hey, I'm going to treat this person poorly. They might not realize that the way they're treating them is treating them poorly, or they might have been treated that way themselves. And they think that that's what you need to do to break them down and build them back up. I cannot tell you how many people told me as a new nurse, you need to grow your duck feathers. That's what this is. That's what you're doing this first year at growing your duck feathers. So everything will roll off your back. And I would say, why is this going to be forever? Is everyone going to be hateful to me and rude forever? Is this what nursing is? Right. Like, why is this a rite of passage? It shouldn't be. This is, this is, this is so you can feel better about being a jerk. Like this is not how this should work. And someone has to stop it. Right. Like there's someone has to say, no, no, we're not going to do this. Like I, I, I'm sorry it happened to you. I don't know that it's made you a better person. Maybe it has, but like we, I don't need to experience this trad, this trauma in my career to know how to be better. You can just tell me, you know, we, and I can get to the next phase. You, I don't have to be emotionally broken down. Um, But in the end, like, I think if you had that conversation with most people who perpetuate that, they wouldn't even realize they were doing it. It was just, it was just how it was done to them. And so they just keep doing it because that's just the tone that they got. There's, there's, there's such a a gap and like, the skill set that's required to be a good mentor, which is what a preceptor should be, it's just a good mentor. Yeah, I think there's there's so much in that emotional toolbox of like leadership that you do have to teach somebody. But what we often do is, oh, you're a good nurse, so you'd be a good preceptor. Much like we do with so many other, oh, you're a good nurse, you'd be a good manager. Oh, you're, yeah. you're you know, like we think that you can do X skill sets that automatically transfers to this, but someone might be a great nurse and know in their head all the things, the right things to do, but communicating that to somebody else and ultimately coaching them into being the best nurse that they can be is a completely different set of skills. And and what's interesting too is that and I, I don't know, I, I feel like hospitals don't realize like how expensive it is to have crappy preceptors. Because if you have people who leave due to their precepting experience, how expensive is that? Like I like well, people who like want to leave after a year because they were hazed and they have this terrible person that they have to work with. Like, like it's. Uh, but although I do, I, can, I do recognize hospitals are short staffed, and they're like they're short staffed with regular nurses. They're short staffed with preceptors, so you do have less than ideal people in those positions. Um, it's just, I wish there was some way to like, I don't know, 
How I don't remember the, the I don't know the number today, but I did do the mm-hmm. research a few years ago to determine like what was the cost of replacing a nurse. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time, uh, it was something like um, one in uh, three nurses would leave their job within the first year, and one in yeah. four of uh, one in four would never return to the nursing profession. And it, I think it was sixty seven thousand dollars was the average cost to replace a nurse. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when it was all said and done, that number is, I'm sure, higher. I don't know what the statistics of nurses leaving is, especially in the last year. Like, yeah, people have oh. really been reevaluating things. But you, you tap, you touched on something that I think is really significant here. We also don't reward people for just being good nurses. Like, we don't. There's not an honor that we place on that of being just a rock star, bedside, excellent, good nurse at what you're doing. We tell them that if they're that, that that's how they get to the next level. And the next level may just be being a rock star, awesome bedside nurse. You don't have to be a manager. You don't have to be a preceptor. You don't have to be an X, Y, and Z. People should be given a choice for those things. Um, I think preceptor is probably one of the best ones to aspire to for a, for being a good nurse. But there's also training and a skill set that goes along with that. And some people just don't want to and shouldn't have to be forced into it. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if you were on a unit where the preceptors who were there enjoyed teaching? And it was like all those nurses who were thinking about getting their MSN in education and they're all the preceptors and they're the ones that want to get better at it. Um, I, you know, that would be, that would be wonderful if that was the thing. <laughs> or if we paid them significantly more because they are actual educators. And then we, uh, you know, we have such a, um, an overabundance of masters prepared nurses who still work bedside, um, and which is absolutely great. There's nothing wrong with that. But what if we were using those people who do have those leadership, that leadership training in those roles? Or what if we just frankly just did a better job of making sure people had tools to learn if and when they wanted to pursue that avenue or they were placed in it um, <laughs> outside of their choosing. So they could at least, at least feel like they had a better skill set and tools um, to get you know, the job done. on, I think Tuesday, I have a Instagram live scheduled with Kelsey at whole life nurse. And we are going to talk about how you can advocate for a raise for yourself, um, as a precept, as a successful preceptor, how you can leverage that expertise and talk in terms of dollars, like we're talking about to get paid more for doing more work. Because especially I think if fair. you can, right? Especially if you can cite the retention, some of the retention. You'll want to look look it up because I haven't done it in a few years. I think my numbers are from about 2017. But especially if you can cite the retention statistics around new grads and then leaving oh, yeah. the profession and how much it costs to replace. Be like, look, I'm going to save you this money because the nurses I precept, they're going to stay because I'm going to mm-hmm. love them so good. And but um, love is a, a word that's sort of triggering to some people. Uh, when you treat somebody well, in my opinion, you're loving them. You're loving on them. You're going to inspire them well. into their best work. Right, right. You're going to inspire them into your their best work. You're gonna you're gonna treat them so well on the unit and help them feel confident in their work and learn the social dynamics and just group, ease into being a new nurse that they're going to feel so committed to the organization because they had that, such a good experience that they're never going to want to leave, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you're going to help perpetuate that culture throughout the unit because you're going to have that vibe with everyone. You're going to treat all your relationships with that same care um, that, that you have with your preceptors. Like there's there's a definitely a, a, a strong argument to have there. Um, and anyone, any leader, uh, the the few dollars an hour you might ask for, that's like, a drop in the bucket for, for keeping staff and a positively impacting culture like that. Oh yeah. Can you imagine if you said, okay, I want $4 more an hour whenever I precept, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to save you $120,000. You win, win, like <laughs> no brainer. Right. So we're going to talk, she's got great insight on that. Um, with those negotiation skills and things. Of course, you're a great negotiator too. But um, we're going to talk about that on Tuesday, which I'm excited about. But um, And just so you guys know, we're talking about how you can like be a good preceptor. We have got a course that'll be, I- I'm going to release it on Monday, which I'm really excited about. I'm putting, once we're done with this live, I'm going to finish some stuff up. Um, but we're going to release it on Monday. It'll be, uh, it's called Preceptor Pro, Your Essential Guide to... Um, uh, becoming an awesome nurse preceptor. So we'll have it for $20 off next week. So I'm excited about that. Um, 
and it'll be normally $67, but next week it'll be 47. So, um, we'll help you guys become great preceptors. So you're not like, like deer in the headlights, like, Oh, here's a notebook. What do I do? Um, and can get to the point where you're like, Hey, I'm going to ask for more money. Darn it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, I think most nurses who are getting into the position of being a preceptor desperately want to do a good job. Mm-hmm. And most preceptees long for someone to, to help them ease into that new experience. And so any information to help someone build their confidence in that area, um, it really all goes back to, you know, training that next generation of nurses. We think about it in terms of nursing school. Yes there's so many people involved and preceptors are such a big cog in the machine of producing the next generation, the next workforce of, of, of new and highly competent nurses. Um, and we really need to make sure that that, you know, that cog is working fine. We put some oil on those axles, that grease is turning, you know, every, everything in that part. And it, because that seems to be the piece that like doesn't get the TLC that it needs. Mm -hmm. We focus on the other, we focus on managers, we focus on nursing school, but that preceptor and preceptee relationship, and then how they're onboarded into an organization and into the wonderful profession, the greatest profession in the world that's nursing. Mm -hmm. Um, It it definitely needs to some more attention so that we can make sure that, you know, all of us have the ability to um, or anyone who wants to function as a preceptor and practice as a preceptor has the ability to make a really positive impact and to know that the work that they're doing to precept that one nurse is going to pay off thousands and thousands of times over years and years you know it's it's like it's like being a parent you you know you have your children and your grandchildren and the generations that you'll build Mm -hmm. the things you do for them the things you do for one preceptor preceptee as a preceptor the things you do for that one person will impact all the patients they serve for the and rest of their career Mm -hmm. and possibly the people that they precept and train after you like oh it's a legacy that you can build by being an excellent preceptor Oh, I mean, can you imagine? So I was so grateful. I had two wonderful preceptors when in those two, or actually three. I mean, really, the whole time I had great preceptors. But it, can you imagine if when I started off my career, if I had someone that was terrible, and I had to deal with bullying, and I had to deal with all that kind of stuff, and then I'm simultaneously trying to learn how to be a good nurse while being bullied, while not learning the things I need to, like how much that can like hinder your ability to really enjoy what you're doing, to move forward um you know you can't hit the ground running like that you just can't because you're like you've just got like this massive thing you have to deal with that is um it's like putting somebody in a race and putting like a a 50 pound weight on their back like you're not gonna get as far like you've got something weighing you down um so yeah like that that long-term impact of what being a good preceptor can and ultimately too if you think about this you're good if you're an informal leader on your unit and i completely agree with you a lot of people desperately want to be good at this they want to be a good preceptor um if you're an informal leader you precept people and and you make you do great a great job and then they in turn become preceptors and a great job and then you know generationally which is probably really just a couple years down the line in terms yeah but you create like you set the standard on your unit like we don't tolerate saying that's not my patient. Like, or we don't talk, you know, we do the, you know, you set the standard and before you know it, you can ultimately create your own like optimal working environment um, when you create that standard. So that's how change happens. It's not like some leader's going to come in and fix it from the top down. Like this, this is like granular, like we hold each other accountable because we're adults and, but we also care about each other. Like that, that's how you create a great work environment. And it spreads, you know, mm-hmm. people, it, it, when somebody sees that somebody else is getting a positive experience and providing a positive experience for their peers and then the patients they serve, it's, it's pretty contagious. So it, oh, yeah. it starts in one person and then it kind of goes on. And the impact that you make as a good preceptor is just overwhelming. Cause you know, you and I talked about the mistakes that we made and some of the bad um, experiences they have, or some opportunities that we could have had, like, it's been, I, I don't, I've been a nurse for like, what, 12 years now? <laughs> and like, that should be, that shouldn't be something that still annoys me. Occasionally I'll be like in the shower and I'll think about stuff like yeah, that. Those, yeah. you, those are not experiences you want to create for people, you know? Oh yeah, well like, look, like the Nursing Uncensored podcast says that my last unit unwilling, forced unwilling nurses to precept and it increased turnover of new hires. Like that is so expensive. 
Like, can you, like, like just, if you just think, if you're a business person, which unfortunately at hospitals, the people making these decisions are not caregivers, they're business people. And while there's value in both, when you're having business people making, you know, logistical decisions based upon caregiving, it's, it gets a little murky. But like, yeah, you put people in this role who don't want to do it and they're going to be terrible at it. Well, you're going to have terrible nurses turn down. Like, yeah, expect that to go well. <laughs> It seems like that would be very obvious. Like, 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 I don't, if you went through nursing school, you're smart enough to make that connection. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it comes back to like, they know, but like, they have nothing else. With, what are they going to do? Like they're in between a rock and a hard space. Like uh, the, the smart thing would be for them to precept them themselves for them to get on the floor and put on well, the scrub and just know, get it done. Or you know what you, if you think of all the money that those new, like the new hires that they left, and tick took all that money and was like, what if you had like a group of nurses, maybe they were unwilling or maybe they were, or maybe you found some people who you could give them a raise and turn this into a job that was, oh, and I was a preceptor. I'd never asked such an easy fix. <laughs> like, like this is like, yeah. What if you found these people who were willing and said, Hey, I'm going to pay you $5 more now or $10 more an hour and turn that role into this coveted role that people work hard to take on. Um, that, I mean, I think that's how you have cultural change and that's how, where you like invest your money where it's like, Oh shoot, I can make $10 more an hour if I'm a preceptor. But then if you are a bad preceptor, you're not going to keep making it. Like we're not going to have you keep doing yeah. it. Like we set the bar high. That's how you make change and make people like, it's not like, and, and that's ultimately also how you foster a safe work environment too. Like, like you apply for that. It's yeah. something that you can, uh, in my unit, it was like pick of the litter. Either it was, they would pick somebody who was their favorite who liked doing it because that person wouldn't have an actual patient load after a few weeks. And that person liked that, or they would just put on whoever, like as a last resort, there was no mindset that somebody might actually enjoy the opportunity, especially if there was pay attached to it. Um, mm -hmm. to, to be a leader and, and impact the next generation. Um, there was none of that. It, how awesome would it be if uh, that was something you could apply for and you could express, oh. you know, because you, it was going to be a raise when you did it. $5 an hour. Who wouldn't apply for that? If oh, they yeah. were going to be good at it. All these people who are like, think they like education, but they're not sure. Like, this is your way to test the waters of like, do I really want to be an educator? And this is how you can probably get people to go back for their masters and be great educators, but still stay at the bedside. Like, I mean, I don't know. The operational side of doing all that is just so interesting to me and how, yeah, we will glad, not gladly, but we'll spend all this money on like new hires and things like that, but not, and travelers and things, but like investing into our own employees so that they're compensated to a degree where they're going to perform really well and have accountability. Like, why can't we do that? I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> well, I think the first step is probably going to be the course you're launching. Uh, or at least a good first step is yeah. just to make sure that people have the tools to be a good one. And then they can use the conversation you're going to have with Kelsey, I think is really great because we, we could, we could right here, right now, we could be inspiring a change that says, look, mm -hmm. I have invested in the skills that I need to be a good preceptor. Mm -hmm. Let's make this something that's a part of our culture in our unit where we pay preceptors more and we value them. It's a program that you have to apply to and you have to have training and skills to do it. And we're the ones that are going to make a big impact around who stays, who gets, you know, a, their good footing, good footing on the unit and how things go for the rest of their careers. Let's let's make a change now. And, it, it, you know, it really starts with that first step of making sure I'm trained to do this and I want to inspire other people to be trained. And I deserve to possibly probably be paid more for doing, oh, yeah. that. you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a distinct skill. Why, why wouldn't I ask for that? They all go together. Yeah. And I love that. It's like, I would love to be a permanent preceptor. Like there's so many people and there are, see, I love to see nurses. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, they said, I love to see nurses that truly love teaching new nurses. And you know what? There's a lot of people out there who genuinely enjoy teaching. Why not we empower, inspire them into their best work and empower them to do that? Like I don't, so I'm excited. So actually for this conversation with Kelsey and I'll probably, you know, package it in this one too, maybe as a bonus into that actual course too, because I think that's the next step is the preceptor is like, okay, I, if I do this well, 
I should be compensated appropriately for this. Like this the hospital's a business, ain't it? Like, I mean, yeah. I have a role here. Um, well, thank you, Brittany. This is really, I love, I love chatting this stuff. If you uh, can't tell. <laughs> Yeah, this is fun. I uh, I feel very strongly about legacy building and and uh, the impact that you make on the patients that you, that you serve and the nurses that you work with. So, um, as you know, I always am such an admirer of the work that you produce for nurses and and hope that they'll find value in this information that we shared today. But also, if they choose to get the course, your your awesome preceptor course, that they'll love it as well. I'm sure they will. Great. Well, thanks, Renee. I will let you guys know more about that course on Monday with like a link and all that while I get it all fancied up here. <laughs> Bye, guys. All right. Bye. the room. You walked in and we are doomed. So hazy smoke in the air from your lips to your legs to your hips to your hair. Sound the alarm and evacuate. I want you to myself.